Hello, everyone, and welcome to today's webinar. Conserving California, applying whole genome sequencing in the California Conservation Genomics Project. My name is Ariel Hannock, and I'm the Director of Applications and Support at CEQUEL. To tell you a little bit more about CEQUEL, we're a reagent company that specializes in solving critical bottlenecks in NGS workflows, specifically to enable high quality data for more samples. Over the past decade, sequencing costs have dropped due in large part to increased sequencing capacity. This has made sequencing more accessible for a wider range of applications, but also presents challenges on how to effectively process and multiplex hundreds or thousands of samples and retain robust and high data quality. SQL FlexWell library preparation kits were designed specifically to meet this challenge. The FlexWell technology has three key phases, sample barcoding, pool barcoding, and library generation. During the sample barcoding phase, DNA is tagged with an I7 barcoded adapter by the sample barcoding or SD reagent. Samples with different I7 indices are then pooled volumetrically into a single tube before undergoing the second phase, pool barcoding. During the pool barcoding, each sample in the pool is tagged with an I5 barcoded adapter. At this point, each sample is dual indexed with the I5 index tracing back to the pool and the I7 index mapping back to the sample. Finally, library fragments are amplified using universal P7, P5 primers. Different pools use different I5 indices, enabling multiple pools to be sequenced on the same flow cell. Plexwell, the Plexwell method is a scalable, true multiplexing library prep. In a conventional workflow, each sample is QC'd, undergoes library prep, and then a library QC, followed by individually normalizing each library before, before pulling it for sequencing. With Plexwell, pooling is done after the sample barcoding and the remainder of the library prep is done in a multiplexed fashion. A key point in the library prep is that the iterative tagging steps preserve sample read count within the pool, meaning that each sample has the same coverage, as is shown here in the blue graph on the right. Effectively, Plexwell allows users to pool early without sacrificing robust performance. This, in turn, increases throughput during library preparation, reduces library QC costs, and alleviates normalization burden prior to loading the sequencer. This approach makes Plexwell suitable for a wide range of applications, including single-cell RNA-seq, high-throughput sequencing of synthetic constructs, whole microbial genome sequencing, metagenomics and microbe sequencing screening, viral whole genome sequencing, low-pass whole genome sequencing, and population genomics. Of specific interest here is conservation genomics, a subset of population genomics. In recent years, it has growing interest due in part to climate change. By utilizing NGS approaches, researchers are able to explore differences in neutral and adaptive variation within and between populations. To effectively make decisions on conservation, it's important to study the breadth of variation within each species. This requires large-scale sequencing studies, such as those conducted by the California Conservation Genomics Project, which aims to sequence 22,000 samples across a wide range of species. SQL is excited to work with the CCGP to develop a tailored Plexwell protocol to meet their project's needs. And with that, I'd like to turn it over to Courtney Miller. Hello, everyone. My name is Courtney Miller, and I am the fund manager slash project manager for the California Conservation Genomics Project. Uh, and I'm just going to take a brief moment to give you some background on the CCGP. Primarily, I'll go over the goals and scope of the project, and then I'll hand it over to Dan Oliveira to get into the technical part of this webinar. The CCGP's overall mission is to provide California policymakers and scientists with resources from genomic data that will inform conservation planning for the state's species, habitats, 
and people in the face of climate change and other threats. Now, the CCTP is a state-funded initiative uh, led by the University of California, Los Angeles, La Crete Center for mm -hmm. California Conservation Science, but it involves a consortium of conservation scientists from across the whole state. At the top of this organization is um, the Scientific Executive Committee that has representatives from five of the 10 UC campuses, also the California Department of Fish and Wildlife, the US Fish and Wildlife Service, and the governor's office. The whole team consists of about 70 principal investigators from across all 10 UC campuses and involves over 100 additional scientists, such as grad students and other collaborators. We also have a special collaboration with the California Department of Fish and of Food and Agriculture um, to look at pest species across the state. Uh, and of course, we work with a variety of state, federal, and scientific partners uh, like CEQUEL um, at various stages of the project. The overarching goal of the CCGP is to build the most comprehensive genomic data set ever assembled for conservation science. And it hopes to do this um, first by generating high quality reference genomes for species across the state. And these will be publicly available on the national database NCBI. Also generating whole genome sequencing data for a geographically representative set of samples um, to map back, map back to the reference genome to look at things like genomic variation. Then um, use the best available satellite imagery and geospatial mapping to integrate the genomic data and environmental data to make um, meaningful statewide maps and tools to show things like hotspots that are climate resilient, corridors to connect those hotspots, and identify critical lands to acquire and protect. Finally, the CCGP will communicate these results with important environmental leaders and decision makers to maximize the impact of these efforts on California conservation, such as determining what products and tools would be the most useful for planning. Um, but this whole genome sequencing um, component is what we're really focusing on today. Just to dive a bit deeper into the scope of the project, the CCGP involves roughly 230 species in every ecoregion across the state of California, totaling over 20,000 individual samples. Um, and these are all being collected by the 70 PIs and their research teams. Here's a bit better look at the taxonomic breadth of the project, where um, a dot on the map is an individual sample locality. So we have a bunch of plants in green dots. Um, in blue are all the marine species, marine plants, vertebrates, invertebrates. Um, in purple, we have insects and other invertebrates. And in red, we have all the terrestrial vertebrates, such as reptiles, amphibians, mammals, birds, um, the whole shebang. Um, and here's where I turn it over to Dan to actually talk about how he approaches generating whole genome sequencing data for such a diverse group of taxa. Thank you for that introduction, Courtney. So as Courtney mentioned, my name is Daniel Oliveira. I am the lead tech for the California Conservation Genomics Project, specifically here at the main core at the University of California, Los Angeles. So today I'm going to be talking about our tissue sequence pipeline and particularly how we're processing this large number of non-model species that Courtney just talked about. So first, to begin this, I want to provide some molecular and historical background on sort of why we're carrying out this project. So the field of conservation genomics has really evolved from the field of conservation genetics. And conservation genetics really use a reduced number of genomic markers or loci for analysis, typically relying on microsatellites. More recent methods fall into several categories, including the first one you can see here, um, reduced representation sequencing or genotyping by sequencing. The premise with this is that you're targeting a small portion of the genome rather than the entire thing. We are still able to get thousands of loci or markers across the genome. There's pros and cons to each of these methods. So the pros are generally there's reduced cost per sample compared to other methods. You have the ability to multiplex individuals into pools, thereby reducing costs again. 
And for larger genome species, this is a good way to get informative and representative data from the entire genome. There's cons as well, mostly the fact that you are targeting a reduced portion of the genome, anywhere from 1 to 15%. So it's generally less informative. And also, these regions are typically neutral by default of the chemistry and the protocol that you're carrying out. And these protocols themselves can also be time intensive. Another method that is recently emerging and becoming more commonplace for conservation genomics as more resources are released is whole genome sequencing or whole genome resequencing. So for this, you're targeting the entirety of the genome for an individual. And the pros for this are that you're targeting both neutral and genomic regions. So it is inherently more informative. And you also generally get more uniform sequence data from across the entire genome. And generally, this method gives more broad and informative data for downstream analyses. The cons are generally that this it requires a higher library and sequencing cost compared to previous methods. And due to the fact that you're targeting the entire genome, um, that scales up pretty quickly in terms of sequencing effort and cost. So that there could be less multiplexing flexibility depending on the input type and sample needs. So this graphic here illustrates some of this. And what you can see on the top is the fraction of the genome that is being sequenced. And in the middle, you can see these different methods I mentioned, including the reduced representation methods. And then on the far right, you can see the whole genome resequencing method. And what's really important is the implications this, these particular data types have on downstream analyses. On the bottom, you can see different types of population genomics analyses. And what we are really interested in, as Courtney mentioned, is this association mapping and population genomic scans level of analyses. So we really want to get the most informative type of data we can by capturing the majority of the genomes of these individuals that we are sequencing. So with this in mind, we chose to go the whole genome resequencing approach for um, sequencing all of our individuals for this project. And it really boiled down to the type of information we'd be getting from this data and the information we would need to really answer questions regarding California biodiversity. This leads us to an obvious next question, which really is how we, how we can leverage whole genome sequencing data to utilize it in the most utmost contemporary way to our advantage to generate critical and informative sequence data for the state of California. So on one end, this is a molecular question of how we're going to accomplish this, but it's also a pipeline development and managerial question since it's, it's such a large number of samples across a large number of uh, projects and lab groups. And from this question, three challenges arise and stem from this. The first one is, how we're going to develop this pipeline that can handle this large diversity of sample types ranging from plant leaves and whole insects to blood and muscle bits, but also extracted DNA that um, individuals will be sending to us. And importantly, these are a bunch of non-model organisms as well. Second is how we can use this above pipeline to create and handle a diversity of taxonomic groups and like I just mentioned, it's important to remember many of the species have either little or no molecular work done on them. If they do, the vast majority have only been microsatellite work that is not very informative for what we are trying to accomplish. The third and last challenge is how we can select a whole genome sequencing library prep method that ensures we are not giving way on both financial and handling time costs for the sake of being able to process different species. And what I mean by that is essentially how can we balance our need to be efficient, but also make sure we're obtaining accurate and usable data for the state of California across all our species. In terms of what our organizational flowchart looks like through this pipeline, this is sort of a very rough sketch of what it looks like. And uh, I would just like to reiterate first that moving forward, uh, Courtney mentioned we have 22,000 samples expected. Only about half of these samples are going to be processed 
through the CCGP mini core that we are running here at UCLA. So that is sort of what I'm going to be focusing on for the rest of this discussion, the pipeline for those samples. The rest of the samples are going to be passing through labs that have the molecular expertise to sort of do the extractions and the library preps themselves and send them off for sequencing. So the mini core was really founded in order to emphasize um, help for those labs that do not have molecular expertise across the UC campuses. So we can really support them to get them this um, type of sequence data. So as we focus on the organizational chart here, samples enter through this pipeline on the top left and they exit on the bottom right when they're sent into sequencing pools where we sequence them at the University of California, Berkeley on a NovaSeq S4. So the main takeaways from this um, organizational chart are the different stages or the different colors. So the blue represents stages for each sample, while the red represents the decision steps. And then the, yeah, the, the orange represents the different QC steps resulting from the, um, the stages. And then the green represents options of what we can do. So essentially this, the, this pipeline we've developed is pretty structured for troubleshooting and decision-making in the sense that as samples progress, through the different stages in blue, we perform the different QC steps. And based upon the results from those QC steps, we have decisions we need to make and options we can go back to, such as asking PIs for additional samples, doing re-extraction, or sort of troubleshooting further. So this allows us to deal pretty efficiently with any issues that can arise with any sort of sample processing. So you might be wondering in practice, what does this pipeline look like for a typical species project? A species project is a term that I'll use to reference about 120 to 150 samples per species that we receive. So if you look at pipeline from start to finish, it generally takes about six to seven days to go from tissue sample to a sequence pool ready for sequencing. And the first step is to do the extraction. And that takes about two days to complete the extractions for all those tissues for a species project. Next, it takes about one day to complete the necessary quality checks to see whether samples fail or pass, so that we can relay that information back to the lab that has submitted the samples to us. It takes an additional day to complete the normalization of samples, and that's extremely important just because we want to get things in the right concentration range for library press, just because, as Ariel mentioned, things are going to be cool. Um, so it's important everything is at an equal concentration range going in. Next, it takes about two to three days to complete the whole genome library prep for all of the individuals when it's been an entire species project, and then carry out the necessary library QC and pooling for sequencing. So now that we have a rough idea of timeline it takes for samples to be processed throughout our pipeline, I'll get into some more specifics of how we address these challenges that I talked about previously. Our first two challenges are sort of interlinked, and we address them in pretty similar ways, and in particular, one major way. So that major way is following a batch sample processing design, so that we can do this in increments of samples rather than individual samples or specific taxonomic groups at one time. Additionally, we made use of a liquid handling robot that not only is capable of doing DNA isolations, but also part of the library prep method up until pooling of individuals into those libraries. So using our AP Motion 5075 liquid handling robot, we can accomplish a large portion of our pipeline. Specifically, with this, DNA isolation can be performed in batches of 48 to 96 individuals, essentially as much as a deep well plate will allow us to do. And to handle the diversity of sample types, as we mentioned, we're handling everything from plants to whole insects to blood samples. We use a variety of specific reagents, such as DDT and PPT digest, and other methods such as seed homogenization and overnight digestion to maximize not only yield, but also increase the purity of our samples. And the majority of our DNA installations and protocols and scripts provided for our liquid handling robot are provided by Mockery Nagel, 
And a lot of these extractions, or the majority of these extractions, are bead-based, which pair pretty well with our lip mill handling robot. Finally, the last note I'll make is SQL's FlexBox technology allows us to make these libraries in initial batches of four, totaling 96 multiplex individuals. And for us, this is incredibly useful because we do not have to make individual libraries for each sample throughout the whole library process. Rather, individual samples are created in individual libraries through the tagmentation process. And after that, they are pooled, which allows us to make libraries in sets of 24 individuals which increases our throughput. So what exactly does this look like on the day-to-day -day or a visual of what this looks like on our robot? You can see here, this is a picture I snapped of a mid-extraction protocol. And you can see on the robot, you can lay out everything you essentially need, tips, wash buffers, extraction plate, the deep well plate. And in particular, I'll focus on what circles here. So this is the deep well plate and it can hold upwards of 96 individuals. So we can really process a batch of tissues pretty quickly in both an automated and a hands-off manner. Of course, as many of you might know, with DNA extractions, there's always some fun variations in how things turn out. So I included some of that here. On the left, we have the digest material of plant extraction. So this is what I like to call the extract uh, plant rainbow, just because these are all the same species, but the digests range in different shades from black to different greens, browns, even some golds, I would say. So it's just fun little things like that that we get throughout the process. And on the right, we also have some issues that we need to troubleshoot as well. So if you can look really closely in the middle, you can see at the edge of one of those tips, there's sort of like a brown blob. And this particular extraction was for the California muscle. And in particular, we're using tissue sample, um, a muscle tissue sample. And the polysaccharides and the mucus for this particular species forms and sort of binds genetic extraction beads. And the result is when the robot, robot pulls up the washing buffers to discard the washing buffer. The mucus filled beads and to have coagulated sort of adhere to the tip and clog the tip. So as you can see, this doesn't come up pretty frequently, but it's through things like this that we're able to tweak our protocol. In this case, we learned that next time we do an extraction for this species, we need to use less input tissue, and that solves our issue. So through these little tweaks, we're able to standardize our process and create taxa-specific protocols are able to handle the majority of troubleshooting cases. In terms of library prep on the robot, as I mentioned previously, the SQL Plexwell library preparation kits are partially automated up to that, everything up to the SB pooling step, in which individuals are joined into 24 sample library pools. So this is what it looks like on the robot. And just highlighting some key points here, you can see the, the blue 96 um, well plate is where an individual SB reaction occurs. So each individual is fragmented with the transposase enzyme, so the DNA is essentially fragmented. And then the I7 tagging reagents are added, so with each individual is barcoded. And then on the red circle on the right, each three columns are put into a single tube, creating a library containing 24 individuals, uniquely tagged individuals. Another useful aspect of this kit and how it has been prepared for us is highlighted here on this white 96 well plate. And what these are, these are the pre aliquoted I7 tagging reagents. And these contain the tagmentation enzymes um, that, that put right onto our liquid handling robot. So our robot can just very easily move in, take aliquots from there and move them into the blue SB reaction plate. And all we have to do is take the plate out of the robot, take the plate out of the freezer, thaw it, and place it on the robot. So once off the robot, the remainder of the library prep process includes the PB reaction step, which is the addition of a library-specific index, and then we have the PCR amplification step, and then a final size selection resulting in dual index libraries. So our real limiting time factor here is how many pooled libraries we can process 
in our magnetic rack, which in this case is 12 libraries, as you can see here. And that means if we accumulate libraries from the automated process I described previously, up to this point, we can process 12 libraries or 288 individuals at once, which is well over an entire species project. And sometimes if a species project is 130 individuals, for example, we can process two at the same time. Now that I've outlined sort of what the pipeline looks in action, I want to talk a little bit more about challenge number three. So challenge three relates to how we can balance our needs for an efficient library prep method with processing with a high processing throughput of different sample types while also limiting our financial and hands-on time costs. So it focuses on the molecular aspect, but also on how we can develop an efficient pipeline. So I've addressed some of this already, particularly with the multiplex nature of the Flexwell kit that allows us to pool and construct multiple libraries in parallel, allowing us to scale up our throughput across taxa across the entire project. But there's some other aspects that um, make this kit really appealing and useful for us. For example, when we look at genome size and taxonomic diversity, we find that within both libraries for individuals and sequencing pools that we send off for sequencing with upwards of 96 individuals, we're able to tolerate variation in genome size pretty well within the range of 0.5 to 0.7 GB without any sort of major impact on sequencing depth or other things. Lastly, one major um, key advantage to this kit has been our hands-on time is greatly reduced due to the fact of the nature of the kit itself, due to it, the fact that it's pooling um, for almost half of the protocol, and the fact that the other half of the protocol that is not pooled, we're able to automate that process. So that allows me to do other things on the bench when the, when the liquid handling robot is pooling samples and creating initial libraries. So now that I've sort of looked at the questions, that and challenges that we've had, I wanted to focus a little bit on sort of the species we are working with and species that we have completed either Plexwell libraries for or that we have recently received sequence data for. So I want to reiterate that although we're still in this, very much in this data collection and data generation phase of our project, we are excited for the next couple months when we begin to complete all the sequencing for various species project. So we have many different species within um, this project, but I wanted to highlight some here. So on the left, this is the American ruby spot stem supply. This is one of our species, our insect species. And for this particular species, we were given 137 tissue samples um, to process for extraction and also to complete library prep for. In the middle, we have an iconic species. Most of you might know the species. It's the black bear. So for this species, we were given 115 DNA extractions that were performed by someone else. And we were given the task of performing the library prep method on those. Next, we have the Sierra willow leaf beetle. And this is a very tiny insect species. And we were given 213 tissue samples and to perform DNA extractions on those and get those ready for whole genome um, library prep as well. So these are some three species we've worked with, and I'll highlight two more on this slide. And as you can see on the left, this species, it's the purple sea urchin. So for this one, we have about 96 tissue samples that we were given, and we performed the DNA extractions and did the whole genome library prep for these species. And finally, on the right, we have the monkey face prickleback, which is an interesting name for a little marine fish found off the coast of California. And for this, we have 135 DNA extractions that were performed, and they were sent to us to do the whole genome library prep. And one interesting takeaway from this little showcase of species, besides showing a bunch of different taxonomic groups in California, is to show that we have process not only a variety of sample inputs, and what I mean by that is that 
A lot of things are, for example, the beetles are processing whole insects, but we're also processing blood samples or other things such as the sea urchin, which is just little tiny spines that are given to us. So we're processing different tissue types, but we're also handling DNA extractions as well. And the key is that we're able to handle DNA extractions that other people have performed using various methods. And we're able to use all of those in a common library prep method and show that it's pretty robust um, within our pipeline. That we have been able to hold up to a variety of different taxa and species demands. And so the difficulties that each one poses for things like DNA isolation or during the library prep process. So now that I've showcased some um, species we are working with and in which we have data back for. It's also um, useful to show the track of the number of samples we've received through the mini core thus far. So you can see here, this is the percentage breakdown of samples that we have received at the mini core. And you can see a large portion of them are in the yellow. Those are terrestrial invertebrates. We've also received a fair number of marine invertebrates in the gray and also herbaceous plants in the dark blue. And to see how this translates into the number of samples we have sequenced so far, so for a lot of those, those are species you just previously saw. So for samples sequenced by the mini core, you can see it reflects pretty well the samples that have been submitted. A lot of the terrestrial invertebrates have been sequenced and a lot of the marine invertebrates have been sequenced, but also a fair number of bird and mammal species as well. You might notice that a lot of the herbaceous plants have not been sequenced yet, and that is just due into part that plant extractions and preparation for library prep require a little bit more work. So we have extracted many plant species, so we're excited to get them into libraries, completed libraries soon, so we can start developing a lot of this novel sequence data for these plant species in the coming months. If we look at all the CCGP species. So remember, if we pan out to the entirety of this project, only about half of the samples are going through this dedicated CCGP mini core down here at UCLA. So if we look at samples that other labs have been doing for their own molecular work, they're also required to submit their sequence data to us so we can perform these overarching bioinformatic analyses on genetic diversity. So we see that overall, for than all samples in which we have sequence data for for CCGP, it aligns pretty well with what I just showed you previously. We can see that the majority are marine invertebrates once again, but also a fair number of terrestrial invertebrates and a large number of birds that have been sequenced as well. Um, so this reflects the most accurate numbers or percentages of a taxonomic breakdown of sequence data that we have for CCGP. Now. As I mentioned before, we're still generating a lot of the sequence data, so we do not have too much to report yet on bioinformatic analyses or these goals that we're trying to get at that Courtney mentioned. But I did want to highlight some data that we have received um, for some species. So here, this is just a violin plot of two species in which we're looking at the sequence data yield that has come off right off the sequencer. So on the right, you can see the Sierra willow leaf beetle or Chrysomella. And you can see that a lot of the distribution of data that we're getting back is around 11 to five or six GB per individual. And on the left, you can see Aphylacoma, which is the California scrub jay. This is another bird species um, that we have in our project. And you can see this distribution is a little less narrow, but it still falls within the range and thresholds of which we need to meet our project um, goals. And what I mean by that is for Aplacoma, we have an expected genome size estimate of 1.21 GB. And for the sequence data we have received so far, about 96 individuals, that we get an average of around 13 um, GB per sample. And if we do some quick math, that gives us around 11x coverage per individual. And our aim here for coverage is really to get at 10x and to fall within a 6 to 12x range to perform these subsequent analyses. So Aphylcoma falls nicely within this range. 
And even for individuals that trail, they're trailing on a larger um, coverage range, which is good for us. For Chrysomella, um, it actually looks a little bit even better. So Chrysomella has a smaller genome size estimate around 0.6 GB. And per sample, we get on average about 8.42 GB coming off the sequencer. And that translates to about 14x coverage average per individual, which is um, well above the targets that we are going for, which is very nice. So not only does this show that we're hitting sort of these metrics that we want to so far, but it's also important since this is a pooled and multiplex approach, it shows that we're getting consistent sequence yields for individuals within a library pool, and that there's minimal concern that individuals within a sequencing pool are dropping out or failing once we receive sequence data. So it makes us pretty confident that we're getting um, useful and informative sequence data for all individuals within a 24 sample pool. Lastly, if we're looking at absolute numbers in terms of samples process, we want to look at sort of where does that leave us? And currently the Minicore has over 4,800 samples that we've received for either just whole genome library prep or for either, or for both DNA isolation and library prep. These span a wide, verse, a wide variety of taxonomic groups, such as blood and plant samples, to whole insects or muscle fragments. And a large portion of these 4,800 samples are tissues that we have already extracted, actually. In fact, we have processed about 2,700 samples from tissue to extracted DNA using our automated extraction protocols on our liquid handling robot. And this includes plants, vertebrate, muscle, whole insects, and blood samples. In terms of how many samples we have sent out and prepared for sequencing that I mentioned earlier, this is about 1,300 samples. And you saw previously what that taxonomic breakdown looked like. In terms of the entire CCGP project, and I showed you sort of earlier how that taxonomic breakdown looks like as well, there's about 2,300 samples that have been sequenced. And this includes the 1,300 samples that the mini core has been offered sequencing as well. So while we're still in this data generation and collation phase, we're excited to keep pushing through the taxonomically diverse sample types over the next few months and really get through the sequence data so we can perform these informative analyses. And just to wrap up, I kind of want to bring us back to our real main question of interest that I outlined um, earlier in this discussion. And really that is how we can go about generating this vast amount of informative sequence data for the state of California on an effective scale. And while we have laid out how we have gone about this on the molecular scale, but also on a pipeline generation scale and development phase, we have also want to outline how we can accomplish this for other projects that are looking to develop similar multi-species projects of their own. And I think there's a couple ways to go about this. First, the batched and automated processing design is key since you're able with this to develop an efficient protocol that allows you to maximize sample processing across a variety of taxonomic groups and sample types. Next, the flexible kits in particular are useful since we can generate whole genome sequencing data for non-model species in a way that minimizes financial and handling time costs freeing up time and resources to focus on other aspects of sample processing, such as DNA isolation and those in-between QC steps. Related to these kits that we're using, the multiplexing of samples across a distribution of genome sizes and different species really allows us to capitalize and maximize on sequencing efficiency on our sequencing platforms that we're using. Essentially, we can get the most bang for our buck when sending off samples for sequencing by including the utmost number of individuals within those pools. And finally, our tissue to sequence pipeline provides a degree of normalization and standardization across these different species and sample types, something that is really difficult to achieve across multi-species projects and includes things as far ranging as plants to invertebrates and different vertebrate species. So with all this in mind and sort of keeping in the batched processing design and sort of the pipeline we have created to handle troubleshooting species. We think the 
the tissue to sequence pipeline that we have developed here is very informative for other projects who are looking to complete similar types of sequencing for different taxonomic groups or just this level of scale of sequencing. And that can be accomplished using our different extraction protocols and scripts that we've developed, while also making use of the whole genome sequencing library kit, such as the SQL flexible kit, that is truly multiplexing samples across different genome sizes and taxonomic diversity. And with that, I just want to thank everyone for coming to our webinar and for all of our collaborators and supporters throughout this project. And I'm happy to answer any questions that anyone might have. Our first question here asks, you showed a nice map of general types of samples and where they were collected. Can you expand on what specific types of plants and animal species you have looked at and how they were chosen? Yes, I can help answer that question. Um, I'm going to start with the last half of it, which is how they were chosen. So the CCGP focused kind of on three groups of species, um, threatened and endangered, of course, um, commercially exploited, and any that are also looking at the kind of opposite end of those, which are wide ranging foundational species that have um, a lot of um, ecological significance. So um, when was CCGP received all the funding, it sent out a call for proposals to help meet the primary goals of the CCGP. So we had um, project investigators from all over the UC system propose target species of sampling design, research approach, a budget, their team members, and then those awards were reviewed and by um, and then selected um, for uh, participation in the CCGP. And you know we have the specific species we have include um, you know grasses, marine invertebrates, um, um, insects, birds, mammals, um, the entire kind of tree of life. All right. Thank you, Courtney. Another question here we have asks, what did you do before SQL's tagmentation slash transpose technology? Sounded like you used a target amplicon approach before, and this allows for a wider look. Can you provide more color on what you moved from and how it changed your thinking? Yeah, so essentially when we started with CCGP, we sort of went through that process of deciding whether we're going to be using a whole genome approach or the RADSeq approach. And the RADSeq approach is pretty similar to Amplicon approach. It's a little different just because it's random throughout the genome. And I believe with an Amplicon approach, you're targeting specific elements. Um, so we, we didn't, within CCGP, we didn't do any sort of um, testing to look at differences in data between this RADSeq approach or um, whole genome sequencing. We sort of just decided to go with whole genome sequencing from the get-go. Um, but there's sort of a long history of labs that have been in CCGP that have been using RADSeq data. So we did have a baseline comparison, trying to look at what that data would look like and trying to piece together what would be most useful. And sort of at the end of the day, we decided to go with that whole genome approach just because um, based upon previous research in these labs, it was more useful for whole genome data. Great, thank you, Daniel. Another question we have here asks, where and how do you archive the samples for later look or repeats? Yeah, I think I can also uh, speak to that question as well. So we do, for most samples, for example, tissue samples that people send to us, uh, for most of these, we don't use the entire sample. If they send us a bunch of leaf samples, we're typically only using like a single leaf for extractions or things like that. So we are keeping a lot of these samples as well for um, a limited amount of time, just in case uh, we need to go back and do a re-extraction or if we get um, or complete the library and get sequencing and things look a little weird. Sometimes you do need to go back to those earlier steps. So we are keeping them sort of throughout a short period of duration while we're generating all this data. And in terms of where we're keeping them, a lot of these samples um, are able to to just be kept in a minus 20 freezer or even at room temperature, for example, for plant samples and they're on dried bees and stuff like that. So we're keeping a lot of them just in case we need to go back and look at things again. Great, thank you. Next question here. What were the toughest specimens or samples your team had to work with? 
Yeah, that's a good question <laughs> to pick out uh, my artist samples. And I think to answer that question, it sort of depends on what aspects of the protocol you're looking on. So some some samples have been sort of typical at the extraction step, as I showed earlier. Uh, the mussel in particular was a difficult species for the extraction step, just because you can't put in too much tissue as you would like, because then you end up with that weird blobby um, attraction to the magnetic beads and the polysaccharides. Um, so there's difficulties there um, with the extraction step. And there's also some difficulties post-extraction step um, in terms of getting samples pure enough, just so they're not interfering with any like inhibition during uh, the tagmentation steps or the, um, the PCR steps as well. So some species, for example, like marine plant species or other marine invertebrate species or even uh, terrestrial herbaceous plant species as well um, are, can be difficult to work with as well just because they have sort of inhibiting compounds that can make downstream steps difficult. Great, thank you. All right, next question. Are you working with archival specimens from the museums to look at species from the past and what happened to them due to climate change and compared to today's species? So in terms of from a technical sort of methodological standpoint, um, we're not working too much with sort of deep archival or museum um, samples just because we want to get pretty good high quality DNA out from these samples for the sort of library prep steps. Um, so there's sort of a threshold where we can't really work with uh, samples that might have sort of any evidence of degradation or DNA degradation. So there's sort of a limit there from the technical step on how far back we can pull samples. Thank you. All right, next question here. How were the specimens to be studied collected? That kind of follows up with um, what I was saying earlier about these um, funded pro uh, projects that the CCGP supports. So it's there's 70 different PIs that have all taken are, have taken the responsibility to collect the samples um, with an emphasis on geographic breadth. So it's depending on if it's a plant or a marine species, they have managed their, their research teams and their research labs to go out into the field and collect those specimens and then send them to us or manage them in their own lab. All right, another question here. It seems that this project can also help other international projects advance. Will the tax specific DNA extraction protocols be made widely available? Yeah, I think that's a really good question just because we're doing all this work and it's really important to let others know how we've done this work so it can be sort of replicated in other settings. Um, so a lot of these protocols the DNA extraction protocols in particular, um, we've just sort of obtained from the two particular companies we're using, Macri Nagel, and then there's another smaller company that we're using for the marine inverts. Um, so they're pretty easily attainable from them. But also on top of that, once we sort of get to this publication phase and we're disseminating sort of our results, I think we're really interested in sort of sharing more specifics and details um, on this like tissue to sequence type one as well, so that it can be replicated across other projects. So I think that's something we're really interested in doing in the future. This next question here is for Courtney. How do you envision these sequences being used to promote conservation? Whole goal of the project. Um, so it's kind of a two part approach. It's generating um, useful tools and data, or useful data and then tools and maps. So it's taking um, the whole genome sequencing data and using it to create um, these landscape-based analyses um, to generate um, statewide maps and of such things like I mentioned a bit in the intro, but like high and low vulnerability regions to climate change, um, corridors to connect these regions, just looking at sensitive species. Um, so taking these, these resources from the data and then also communicating them to folks that make the decisions in the state. So working with state policymakers and stakeholders to to really work out what the best strategy is to to use this data and to apply it um, with into management practices. And this last question asks, what pipelines are you using for genome assembly? 
it's our two part question here. The second part says, are you performing reference guided assembly and are your reference genomes created using long read sequencing technologies? Yes, yeah, so the reference genomes are created using a kind of two-pronged approach with HiFi, PacBio HiFi sequencing and OmniC sequencing, and then assembled, um, and then kind of a little bit of curation, genome assembly curation, and then yes, the whole genome resequencing will be mapped to those to those reads. Before we go, I'd like to thank the audience for joining us today and for their interesting questions. Until next time, take care, everyone. Goodbye.